Okay, so welcome back, um, everyone. Welcome to the last day of the school. So it's my pleasure here to introduce Adele Ribeiro. So Adele is currently a postdoc at uh, Marburg. I think I'm spelling it correctly. So before she was at Columbia as a postdoc with Elias Badenbaum, and her work is on causal discovery, causal inference, and applications of these related to healthcare. So Adele, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And let's welcome Adele. So thank you for everyone to uh, stay here with me uh, in this last day. <laughs> Hope you're not too tired. Uh, but the talk today is really exciting. Well, I'm a bit suspicious <laughs> to say this, but uh, it's about causality. And uh, causality has been, um, we, we, we have a lot of attract, uh, attention on it uh, because of his role in reasoning, explainability, and general, generalizability. So I, I will try to cover a little bit about these topics in the lecture today. So um, recent breakthroughs in AI. I think everyone is a bit of tired about it, but uh, we know already that we can learn models or very large models uh, that can make uh, predictions extremely well, even in high dimensional settings. And we have a huge progresses in natural language, pro language processing, computer vision, and reinforcement learning. Uh, however, uh, oh, these are just some examples. Uh, for example, we have fully autonomous cars. Uh, AI systems can predict some diseases now better than human doctors. Um, we have now GPT uh, that uh, is very exciting, a little bit scary sometimes. Uh, but what are the challenges? I think that's uh, what are the most important questions today. Is is there anything that uh, we that, uh, we can do, or like we are done? Uh, of course, there are many things. So the, the first one is about explainability. So if you if you design a system that can predict a disease, it's really hard to understand how you actually make this, this how how the, the system got to this. Uh, uh, to the outcome, or what are the the the, the mechanisms the mechanisms that uh, actually um, made such a prediction, or uh, how can we know if the system is actually fair according to the standards of our society? Is there any bias accord, uh, related to gender, to uh, uh, um, uh, maybe socioeconomic status or other uh, racial biases? So there are so many biases and how can we actually make sure that we are not just reinforcing the same bias that we already have in society? So we would need like a, a, a much more understanding about what the systems are doing to actually evaluate this type of questions. Uh, and in the end, we, what is actually needed in the systems is about uh, reasoning about cause and effects. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the, the, the actually what, what we uh, are, are going to actually discuss in the lecture today. Um, maybe you have heard about Yuda Pro. Yuda Pro is the father of causality. Uh, he wrote this book. Uh, it, we, we call it as the Bible of the topic. <laughs> Uh, of course, it's just a, ver a very large, uh, it's a reference book. It's, uh, I would say that every research in the field would have like a, 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 an example of this in your house. Uh, and uh, he's a director of the Cognitive System Lab Laboratory at, uh, at uh, uh, UCLA. Also, he won the uh, Turing Award in 2011. And because of, of his work in causal, uh, in, in the calculus for probabilistic and causal reasoning. And he has his very, uh, his quote, uh, he, he has this very famous quote uh, that is in the book of the Y, uh, who, the book of Y that says, deep learning has in instead given machines that uh, with truly impressive abilities, but no intelligence. And the difference uh, between abilities and intelligence, intelligence is really profound and lies in the absence of uh, a model of reality. And uh, this, this tells us a lot about what's happening today. So we have these impressive abilities 
to do pattern recognition, to do classification, any type, any type of prediction. But uh, we actually don't have a way to reason about what's happening uh, in, in, the, in the underlying model, right? Uh, and this is what would give us this type of intelligence uh, to, uh, that would actually reflect the data generating model. Uh, Yosha Benju also uh, have an uh, interesting uh, vision about the, the, the machine learning today. So Yosha is uh, the prof a professor at the University of Montreal, also in Mila. He also won a Turing Award uh, the, uh, together with Geoffrey, Hint Geoffrey Hinton and Ian Lecun, uh, mostly because of his work uh, in deep neural network. And basically, he says that the causality is very important for the next, next steps of progress of machine learning. So he also agrees with this vision. Uh, recently, uh, we got uh, uh, we have these two uh, amazing professors, Guido Inbens and Yosha uh, Angrist, Angrist, that uh, they won the Nobel Prize in economics, also about causality. So a lot of a lot is going on. Uh, related to causality, but why causality is so important? So causality is an essential component in the development, I would say, of the new generation of AI, because of uh, it allows allow us to have a few capabilities. So the first one is explainability, because uh, even if you don't have the uh, you understand this later, but even if you don't under, if you don't have the full model that generate the data, you still can learn some uh, particularities about the model. For example, the directionality or the existence of confounding, and this is usually through something that we call causal structural learning. Uh, also, we can reason about uh, effects of interventions. So you don't need to actually perform an experiment to actually see what would happen if you perform an intervention. Uh, we say that we can actually determine the effect of unrealized interventions right, rather than just predicting an outcome. So that's actually exactly the difference between statistical associations and causation. Uh, because we have explainability, we have a, 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 an ability to infer effects of intervention, we can also infer, uh, as a particular example, infer what uh, about fairness. We can uh, evaluate the, uh, uh, what are the path specific effects related to these uh, protective variables like sex or gender or uh, race. Uh, so if you are really interested about what happened, what's the relevance of a variable in the model or how this variable is contributing to some discrimination or, 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 uh, or if, so to understand actually the role of these variables in the model, you, you should include causality in the design of your uh, system. Uh, generalizability, because uh, once you uh, understand uh, the differences between populations, so usually what is generalizability? You actually design an, a system that has uh, a good prediction. We call it internal, uh, internal uh, predictive power because you, you have ability to actually infer what actually you have, you, you have observed in, in your training data set. But when you see something that, when you try to predict something about a new observation, something that you haven't seen yet, or in a different population, in a different domain, something that you that that you would like to generalize, it's important to account for the differences across all these domains. And uh, in the field here, we have a language to actually explain these different differences, the similarities. So it allows us to really have uh, 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 um, uh, uh, the correct uh, effect or the correct prediction in a different domain. Uh, also, as I, I, I mentioned already, it's it's a language. So we with causality, you can encode all your knowledge. So if you have, if you understand uh, how the data was collected, uh, in which population, or what, what uh, if if there there is any randomization in the process of collecting the data, or if it's pur purely observational. So everything that you understand about your data or about the environment that you collected this data should be encoded with a, 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 a principal language, and causality actually provides this and allows you to have data fusion. Um, so causal data science is exactly, so as a summary, is, a, is 
we have like three different goals. The first one is to combine all these different uh, data sets that you have available. Usually we don't have just observational data set. Maybe you can combine interventional data set. Maybe you can combine data sets coming from different populations, different cultures, different uh, could be even animals or depending on the field. Uh, so how can you actually combine all these data sets? Then once you know how to do uh, the, the fusion correctly, how can you actually infer uh, anything about the underlying module? And then you actually understand what are the effects of interventions, what are the, uh, the mechanisms or the di directionality about the, the relationships. And then you can make more robust and generalizable decisions by uh, observing this, this uh, by, by using this, this knowledge that you could in, infer. Um, one paper that uh, it's from Elias Barenboim and, and uh, Yuda Pro is, uh, is our, uh, from 2016, but uh, I would say that it has a good summary about the tasks that, the, 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 that we are interested right now. Uh, of course, to learn, you would have to go uh, to other papers and understand each of the topics, but you will understand at least what are the uh, the, the current challenges that we are dealing with, uh, we are uh, working with with them right now. Uh, so this is the paper, it's a PINAS paper in the about causal inference in the data fusion problem. Uh, if you're learning or researching or uh, in just interested in causality, I really recommend you to access, to register in this website, causalfusion.net. It's a really nice web application where you can uh, basically through examples and it's an uh, interactive web application where you can draw your, your graph or make causal inference questions there. So you can have a, a way to uh, learn all the topics that we're going to see here. I really recommend it. It's a really nice uh, application. It was developed by uh, Elias Barenboi and his team there in, at Columbia University. Uh, so as I said, the, uh, the causality theory was developed by, uh, I mean, I, I shouldn't say this, but the modern version of causality, I would say that has the approach of graphical models and gave us this language to uh, understand in a more transparent way uh, what, 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 what actually are uh, the assumptions or the knowledge that you have about your data, your system. So it was developed by Udaya Pro. And uh, if you are just starting, I recommend you to read the book of why. It's just a very easy take about what's going on and his view about the field. Uh, of course, it's not a technical book, so you cannot just stop here. You can start reading other books like this. This is a very short introductory book about causal inference. Uh, it's, it's in statistics, but uh, you, you can just read. It's really short. If, if you're giving a course, you can basically in two or three lectures cover most of the topics here. Um, and uh, I would start with it. And uh, if, as I said, it's more like a reference book, but if you if you want to know more about that, you, you could also uh, read the causality book uh, by Pure. Uh, the causal inference in statistics has also a website. Uh, it's kind of uh, similar to the causal fusion, but it's much simpler and it's just covering the examples of this book. So again, if you don't want to uh, register to that top website. It's free. You just use your academic email, academic academic email. But that that one is completely open. You just open the website and start using it, and you can actually uh, see uh, graphically and through this interface, you can play with the models that are in the examples in this book. So it's also a nice website. Um, okay, so let's start now talking a little bit more technically, but. Uh, uh, is not, it's still a big picture of the, what's going on. And, and the, that's an important distinct, distinction that we have to do. That's be, be, what is the difference between prediction and reasoning? Why is not the same, right? And it's actually related to the difference between statistical association and causation. So uh, I have a question for you. So imagine uh, that uh, I, so I have this task. So can I guess how serious or big is a fire? by just looking at the number of firefighters that are there in action trying to uh, kill the fire. What do you think? 
So you just look through the through the window, you see like a bunch of firefighters there trying to kill the fire. Can you guess how 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 is the size of this fire? It's pretty big, probably. But if you see just one firefighter there, probably it's just nothing serious and don't need to care about it, right? So you can guess, of course. That's prediction, right? So you can just get two variables. You get the, the number of fire, firefighters in action, how serious is actually the fire. So your labels are, are the seriousness of fire. If you make a regression, you see a kind of a perfect uh, correlation there. Uh, you can basically guess pretty well. Uh, and the fact that you have association, just a statistical association, correlation, this is sufficient just to make a variable a good predictor. Just association, doesn't matter how is this correlated to the, to the outcome. If that is association, if, if that is correlation here that's different than zero, then X is a good predictor of Y. However, and, and Y is, and this, that is uh, something that you can actually get from observational data, right? So you, you have, that's the, kind of the definition of correlation. So if you if the probability of Y, given that you observed the value of, of X is different than just the probability of Y, which means that the X helped you to do the prediction of Y, then, uh, then that's, that's good for prediction. So that, that's okay. And you can get from just the observational distribution, which is the distribution from the observational data. Uh, so, Conclusion is the seriousness of fire increase with the number of firefighters. Got it. Let's try to reason about it. Conclusion, the size of the fire increases with the number of firefighters, as I said. Okay, in other words, the fear the firefighters, the smaller, the, the smaller the fire. Then someone can just, can just say, should we decrease the number of firefighters to reduce the fire? We could propose this, right? Why not? It's, of course, we know that that's not the case. And we know because we know the underlying model. You cannot answer this question. Of course, firefighters and fire, fire it's something that's our, our uh, daily life. But if it's something that you don't have any guess about what's the underlying model, you couldn't just try to use this information to do some, uh, some to reason about it, to make, to, to do some to make uh, decisions about uh, interventions, right? So that's what I'm proposing here. Let's make it, let's decrease the number of firefighters as an intervention. And to do this, you cannot just use correlations, right? And uh, as I said, we need to know a little bit about the underlying model. And that's that's just uh, an abstract way of, of writing it, but that, that the X here, that's the number of firefighters, is a function of the seriousness of fire, right? So depending on the size of the fire, we will have higher uh, a higher number or, or a, a lower number of, of firefighters and not the other way around. Like the seriousness of the fire depends on other variables, these variables use that are just environmental var uh, variables, something else that uh, it's could be even a measured, right? It's a hidden or latent variable. Uh, and since y is not a function of x, this means that y is not caused by x. So that's kind of the intuition of cause for us. If x is a function of y, then x is a cause of y. If it's not part of the function, then it's not a cause. And uh, a way to actually detect what would be the effect of x on y would be to just replace the function of x to just a constant. This is just mimicking an intervention. So when you do an intervention, you just go there in the model, just replace everything that was uh, influencing the, 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 the value of X and you just fix it. Like let's, let's put number of firefighters is equal to 10 and see what will happen with the fire. Would actually increase, decrease, let's see what would happen. And the Y here in this case won't change because Y doesn't depend on the X. So if I change the number of firefighters, I won't change the fire. However, however uh, and, and usually you don't have access to this information because usually you don't perform the intervention. You would like to actually have access to something that we call uh, interventional probability distribution. So we have this notation for the do, 
So the do is just a hypothetical intervention that we are performing in this variable X. So we, we actually are interested in the value of Y or the probability of Y after doing, right, doing X equals to X. And in the case of this example, this is going to be exactly probability of Y, which means that uh, the action is independent of Y. And uh, in, this, in, in this example, we cannot change the size of fire by changing the number of firefighters or X is not, uh, the effect of X on Y is just zero, right? Uh, so let's now formalize what is this underlying model that I just told you, because that would be the model that you would, would give you fully explainability is the data generating model, right? So if you are interested to do any, um uh I, I, it's the most complete way of understanding a model so uh let's just see it how how it goes so we define a structure causal model or the data generating model as a tuple that has just four components here the first one is we usually call it as v and this v are the variables that you actually measured so are the endogenous variables we also are going to denote as you all the other variables that are important for the system, but they are not measured. So they are latent variables or hidden variables or uh, exogenous variables. Also, we will have a function, uh, a set of function, functions uh, that determine every variable in V. So for all those variables that we measured, th these variables are a function of this PA, it's just PA are the parents or the endogenous causes. So those are the variables that are causes of, of VI, but were observed. And also we have the parents that were not observed, that's going to be UI. So it's just a notation. Uh, and of course we need the probability of the U, the U variables uh, and uh, uh, this would make uh, the, the, the structure causal model complete. We make one assumption, it's the only assumption that we're going to make, that M is recursive, which means that we have no feedback in the, no cycle, it, that, that it's actually an acyclic uh, model, right? I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you if you if you pick a variable, it it can only be function of the variables that were defined before, so that exists an order, a topological order of this in in this model. Um, and now imagine that you have access to this structure causal model, right? And if you don't have any, uh, if you if you if you observe the nature as it is, so we call it pre-interventional or observational structure causal model. So it's the model as it is. Uh, you would describe it as this. Basically, the, the 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 four components that I described are here. And imagine that we have this example where we have x and y, and uh, x is uh, a function of two exogenous variables, y is a function of x and two other exogenous variables, but they shared one common uh, u variable, right? So it's hidden, it's shared. Uh, when we perform an intervention, as I mentioned, we just replace the equation of x to just a constant x. If we get the model so if we for example we collect the data from the model as it is and then we estimate the probability distribution and 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 see how it goes so that's the, the notation so that's the probability of the variables that i observed so it's the the probability that's induced by this model of m m over z or over m and uh we can use this probability which i i call as observational distribution and i can make predictions pretty well with it so I can predict uh, the value of Y after observing, just observing the value of X. I can just do correlation. If I have, however, access to the other side of the road, this road, this hypothetical road where I performed the intervention on X and it, I just consider the induced probability of the variables V after doing this intervention on X. So this is the interventional distribution and it's denoted like this we would now be able to predict the value of y after making this intervention do x, as I told you. So if that is at least at least one x, one value of x, such that the probability of y in this intervened module, so where 
when I, I uh, if the probability after doing this intervention is different from the probability before doing the intervention for at least one level, then it's because X affected in some way Y. So it's a cause of Y. So that's the kind of notations that uh, you are going to use through this lecture. And you can see pretty well that that exists two different roads here. The world where you just collected the data, that's the observational world, and the world where you would like to have access. So you usually didn't perform the, ex the experiment yet. So you want to just know what would be the causal effect just using observational data. So it's a hypothetical world, but it's a different world where it's different. So you have a different induced probability and we can actually do different questions with it. We can answer different questions with it. One example that's pretty common in economics and statistics, which is also a structure causal model, is the structural equation model. Maybe you have heard about it. And you can see here that if we can rewrite the, the model exactly as I wrote before. So suppose that I have a model with X, Y, and Z. Our U variables are going to be our error terms. So everything that's that's random in my model is just those, it's capturing these variables that are unobserved. Uh, my functions here usually are linear. So you, you kind of can write what are even the coefficients of it. Sometimes you have to impose a few constraints in the model so you can actually solve it. So for example, you can say that the U variables are distributed, are, uh, have follow a normal distribution, distribution with uh, uh, independent covariance matrix, which means that the error terms are all independent. So you kind of see here that uh, is, is in the same structure, but I'm imposing much more constraints. I'm saying that they are linear functions, normal distribution. This, this idea of the error terms are, are independent of each other actually means that you don't have any confounding. So any variable that's confounding the relationship that's unobserved. And in the field, we call this model as being Markovian, Markovian. So this is assumption called Markovianity. Sometimes it's also called causal sufficiency, which means that uh, you, you measured everything that's important. Basically, it's a, a bit strong, but that, that's common in the field. Um, and then this is just a good example, I believe, because it's showing that if you're looking for the structure causal model, if you're looking to, if your goal is to learn the structure causal model, it is too hard. You have to kind of impose so many constraints to actually have the identifiability of these coefficients and have in the end a model that where you could estimate all these this coefficients that uh, could be sometimes uh, unrealistic, right? And it's, this is this is the way to, that there's no way there's no different way to do because to have identifiability of this model you would need to impose such such a constraint, such constraints. Uh, but it is a structural causal model. If you're correct about all these assumptions that you make, then in the end, everything that you're going to infer in the end is causal. But I mean, you need to be right about all those assumptions, right? And uh, so that's my point. Structural causal models are an encoder of functional knowledge. It's, it's, it's a very powerful knowledge. You need a exactly the form of the functions, how your data was generated, you, you, you can write. Like you can analytically write the functions for your data. It's kind of too much, right? So the knowledge you require to fully specify a structural causal model is usually unavailable. And it's, however, that that's what the, the, the approach. So when uh, we have causal in causality, in the causality field, people kind of gave up about estimating the structural causal model because it's too hard. It's impossible, to be honest, unless you make these very strong assumptions. So if you want to relax these assumptions a little bit and be more fair or more uh, robust against what you see in Pratt's, can you do something at least with, without specifying the functions? And that's the question. Is it possible to identify effect of interventions from observational data but without fully specifying the structural causal model or in a non-parametric fashion. And yes, that's kind of good. <laughs> and, but we will need something. It's not just data. And yes, we can do it, but we need to know at least the structural 
uh, they, we, we need the structural knowledge about the model. So we don't ask you about the, the form of the functions, but we need at least the relationship of the variables, how one variable is related to another in, in, in or the order of the variables, if that is confounding or not. And this is going to be encoded as a causal diagram. So I'm going to define a causal diagram now. And uh, as I said, it's encoding structure causal knowledge. So, uh, so I put in gray here just because it's usually unknown, right? However, we know we could reason that, or we can use our prior knowledge, our domain knowledge about some domains to even be, sometimes it's really hard to write the function, but sometimes we know the order or which variables come before the order, right? And that's what we are going to ask you. So um, we construct a causal, a causal diagram. So we imagine that that exists is a structure causal model. And we are going to, for every variable that's in the set V, so only for the measured variables, we are going to add an arrow going from VI to VJ if VI appears as an argument of the function of VI. So uh, VJ, sorry. So VI is an argument for the function of VJ, right? So if it appears as a function, if VI is needed to, the, to, the, to, to uh, give a, uh, to determine the value of VJ, then we are going to add this error here uh, from VI to VJ. So in our example, I have here, uh, for example, B uh, doesn't depend on any V variables. So there is nothing pointing to V. C, however, depends on A and B. Also, A doesn't depend on anything. This is an example that I, I mean, I, I try to give a little bit of context here in natural language process. Uh, but uh, basically, imagine that uh, if you want to determine if a, 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 a sentence is a joke or is a funny joke, uh, and you would like to understand what, what's the uh, effect of this self-deprecation in, in, in making jokes, of course, depends on many other things. So if you actually would incorporate all the variables that are here, there are many unobserved variables. So we have many variables that kind of uh, determine the, the, the self-deprecation in a joke, but we also have environment or co cultural factors that are determining if uh, I'm going to do this self-deprecation joke or not. Uh, it's possible to have like some background laughing or anything that's in the environment that's going to affect if you're going to believe that this is a funny joke or not. So that's A, and it, it was measured in my example. But everything that's in gray is something that we call it, uh, so are part of the U variables here, and it, it's just hidden. So they are latent variables. And because of the existence of these variables, it's possible that there's, there's some confounding and every variable that's just pointing here, but it's not connected to other, they are kind of uh, ir irrelevant in terms of effects of interventions. Of course, they are important in, in the construction of a structural causal model, but they are not important just to determine if a variable has an effect to another. And the second condition for our graph is just uh, account for uh, uh, these uh, U variables that are shared in, fun in two different functions. So for example, B and A, they share the same U. And since they share the same U, this forms a confounding, right? And because forms a confounding, I have to replace this with a bidirected edge that's dashed. It's just a way to, to encode the existence of confounding because that's, that variable actually induces correlation between B and A, and it's not due to C here. Actually, it's not due it is, it is just because of this common uh, cause that's hidden. And all the others, as I said, they are not relevant for, for at least for the task of, of effect of interventions. So we just hide it. So in the end, we're going to see a graph like this. And uh, it, the meaning of it, it's, it's much more than a Bayesian network. It's a causal Bayesian network or causal diagram because uh, it's actually indicates the order of the functions that are in this, this uh, underlying structure causal module. So every bidirected edge means a real confounder and a directed edge really means that the, the function depends on this variable, okay? So that's, that's a causal diagram. 
uh, and we can reason about it right now. Uh, so once we have a causal diagram, we can use a tool that's called the separation. Doesn't you uh, have heard about it? Any of you have heard about it? Okay, that's good. Uh, so this separation is one of the most important tools to start with causality. If you don't know it, it's going to be really, really hard to follow everything else. I'm going to try to teach you. It's really hard to actually grasp in a, in a minute. <laughs> But I really hope that you follow and uh, we, we will continue the rest of the lecture. So the first definition that we're going to need is about inac inactivity or a, a triplet being inactive. So a triplet is just a sub path uh, where you have three variables, VI, VM, and VJ, right? And they are connected. So it's a triplet. So VI is connected to VM and VM is connected to VJ. Just that, that I need. It's a sub path. And this path, uh, subpath, is going to be inactive. It's always relative to a set. So it's relative to a set Z. If the VM, the variable in the middle, is a non-collider. A non-collider is just a variable that uh, it's, you don't have two arrows pointing to it. So as long as you don't have two arrow heads pointing to it, it's a non-collider. The collider has an arrow point, two arrows pointing to it. Non-collider is everything else. So if the variable in the middle, it's a non-collider, and then you, you have this VM in the, ver in the set Z, then the triplet is inactive. I like to kind of make a, uh, an, uh, I, I like to kind of tell a story when I, I think about the separation that maybe helps you. That suppose that you, you are kind of seeing um, uh, a flow of water, like you, you have pipes. So those three variables are two pipes connected. And if the variable in the middle, if, if you kind of break it, you break also the flow of the water, right? Um, so, but you need to, to, to condition on it. You need to make it like, an, uh, you, you need to um, break it. I don't know, condition being break it. Uh, the other one is about if the variable in the middle is a collider and also, this collider is not in the set C. So the, that's uh, going back to, to, to my story, like if you already have a collision in the water, the water is not going to one side or to the other. There's no flow of information, it's just collision. So the information is colliding in the middle. So you don't need to do anything about the variable, Z, uh, the variable in the middle. You don't need to put in the set Z because it's already blocked, it's already inactive. Uh, we have a weird thing here that also not, uh, none of the descendants of a collider can, can be in the, in the set C, because if you put this descendant or the collider in the set C, then you are going to turn the triplet active, okay? Uh, but let's just go to the next definition and then to the example, I think it's going to be more clear. So the disseparation is just when now uh, we are, so this separation is related to a path, uh, no, sorry, let's just see that a path in the causal diagram is going to be disseparated or blocked by a set of variables Z if and only if P contains an inactive uh, triplet. So you just need one inactive triplet in the whole path to block everything. It's kind of the flow of the water. So if you block one, one junction there, then that's fine. You blocked everything. But this is related to a path, right? And then we say that... Uh, Z disseparates two sets of variables if Z blocks every path between all these two, uh, all variables in X to all variables in Z. So between any variable in X to any variable in Y, you cannot have an open path. And an open path would be uh, uh, having no inactive triplet, right? So um, to disseparate two sets of variables, you just need to find one inactive triplet in each of the paths. That's it. Uh, so let's see an example here. So let's see if it's, I want to ask you which set Z disseparates X and Y. So I have X here, Y and here. So as I said, you need to look at the paths connecting these two variables. So my, my set, Z, uh, set X and set Y just have one variable. X is in the set X, Y is in the set Y. And uh, the, there are two paths between both, right? So there is this one that's through the bidirected edge. And that is this other that in the middle here, I go through this directed edge and go back here. So, so there are two paths connecting X and Y. And I need to guarantee that for a specific set Z, those two paths are blocked. So let's see, is the 
empty set blocking all the paths. Uh, so the first, so to block, I just need to uh, have one inactive triplet. And one inactive triplet is the one that uh, either I have a collider that's not in Z or I have a non-collider that's in Z. And this one is a collider. And since it's the empty set, B is not there. So this is blocked. So I don't even need to see what's happening after it. I have already one triplet that's inactive. Now, if I look to the second one, this path here through X, B, and B directed edge to W is no longer a collider, right? So that's open. So this triplet X, B, and W in this path is active. And that's not good yet. So I need to go to the second triplet, B, W, and Y. Oh, now it's a collider and the collider is not in the set Z. So this other path is also blocked already. So in the end, they set the empty set is uh, already disseparating X and Y. All of you agree with it? Sorry, um, when you have like X, B, and then W, why do you ignore them the, the undirected edge? Undirected edge? Uh -huh. Sorry. Um, so if you have a triple XBW, then B is still a collider, no? No, no. So you, uh, 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 a triplet is a subpath. So you, you cannot look at all the edges between all. Oh, okay. So it, it's just like this. So either you look at this triplet through this bidirected edge plus the directed edge or the second triplet that X, B, and W, but the X, B, and the, the, the other bidirected edge here. Okay, so the triplet does not only define the nodes, but also the edges. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and then in this case, you, you have both. One with a collider, and other with a non-collider. Hi, sorry, just a probably stupid uh, clarification question, but um, like there's the directed edge, so why... Is the is the same question like between x and y and y and, and y and x like in the opposite direction? Opposite direction. I don't really like, like if you want to go from x to y, you can go like there's a directed edge between b and w. Okay, so there are two paths between mm -hmm. them. I don't know about going like I'm not requiring you to have just one path. You can have many paths. You cannot have cycles, and there is no cycle here, right? So you have two paths. This is not a cycle. This is not mm -hmm. bidirected in the sense that you are going to one side or to another. It's just this common cause that's latent that I explained to you. So uh, what's happening here is, is just that uh, uh, y is a function of just one unobserved variable. Uh, w is a function of the same unobserved variable plus another unobserved variable that is a cause of B and W, and also a, a function of B. And B is a function of this unobserved variable between B and W, and also the other unobserved variable between X and B. And X is a function of this another observed, unobserved variable. So you, you don't need to think about going to one side to another because it's kind of... It's not the way that we're uh, interpreting these causal diagrams. This is just a model represented in a gra graphical way, right? Okay, so, so like if I ask, does Z D separate Y and X, it's the same answer? Yeah, so. the connection you're going to see later that uh, the separation implies condition independence. This is going to be right. Oh, I, I didn't want to give the answer here. But uh, you're going to see that if X and Y are disseparated, then X and Y are independent, independent in the distribution, mm -hmm. right? So that is this connection. I'm going to explain right next to, to this example, right, right after to it. But then um, the intuition is this flow of information. So since the information from Y is not reaching the information of, 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 of the X, the information from X is not reaching the information of, or helping the information in, in Y, you don't see correlation. But if there's any way to reach by conditioning on something, and that's an important thing about this, because 
you, you sometimes we think that condition on a variable you are you are always blocking information or adjusting for like in a regression this is not true if you condition on something which is kind of in a regression you are just adding a, a variable there or in a deep neural network you are just adding a predictor you are using this information you are seeing the the value of this variable and then making an observation about that mm -hmm. this is conditioning so the fact that to observe the value of this variable actually can induce correlation, right? And that's the point of the colliders. Once you add the information of the collider, the other variables that were, in this case, uh, X and Y are independent marginally. You're, seeing, you're going to see in the next examples that you can actually make them connected. And this is going to imply mm. correlation in the distribution. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to continue then. So uh, the, the next question is about the set B. So the set B is uh, now a collider. And let's just again, evaluate all the two paths. So if I condition on, on B, then this triplet that has the collider, so the triplet through the bidirected edge is going to be active. And, uh, but that's not a problem because I have, following here in the path, the second triplet is still inactive. So I'm still fine. I just need one inactive triplet. Now for the second path, when I condition on B, this is a non-collider and this is already blocked, right? So the triplet is inactive. So entire block, entire path is blocked. So I don't need to condition to, to see what's happening after it. So conditioning on B also makes X and Y disseparated. Now, uh, I ask you about the W. W is a bit more tricky. Uh, can any, any of you explain why? Can you just tell me what's the op open path after conditioning on W? Let's go one by one here. So uh, when I condition on W, what happened with this triplet here? This is a collider. But W is a descendant of the B. So it's kind of in the second condition here. That's why I, I said it's a weird condition because condition on the descendant of the collider also brings information about the collider itself. And that's why it's kind of opening this flow of information. So conditioning on W opens this sub path here to the two bidirected edges. And I already, so W is also a collider itself in this second triplet. So this path through bidirected paths is, is, is bidirected edge is also, it's completely open now because all the triplets are active. And that's why Z is no longer uh, disseparating X and Y. The Z that contains the W actually creates a correlation between X and Y. And if you go in your data, it's possible that you're going to see X and Y completely independent. Then you condition on B, is it still independent? But now you condition on W, oh, now it's dependent. What's happening? And that's one of the situations where this happened. Uh, what about B and W? I guess it's kind of clear right now. Once you condition on W, you already had this path here open. So conditioning on B, it's keeping it open. So it is still not separating X and Y. So it's really important, the idea of the separation, because gives you, uh, um, it, it, it can actually explain what happened when you observe different values, different variables in a regression, you are conditioning on variables when you add them as predictor. In a deep neural network, you are conditioning on these variables when you use them as part of your model. You understand? So you can create associations by just using these variables. And this doesn't mean that have the causal relationship. They can be just spiritually associated. Got, got it? And that's the idea. Uh, I told you that there is this connection between the separation and, and condition independence, and that's called global Markov property that says that every disseparation in my causal diagram actually implies a condition independence in the probability distribution, right? So these separations imply condition independences. So that's the connection about it. We can reason about at least condition independences just by having the graph, okay? Uh, and uh, I, I also like this uh, graph because kind of tells you exactly 
uh, what are the region of influence of a variable. Uh, so for example, suppose that my goal is to do some classification about the variable V. So V is the outcome that you're interested in. Like my, uh, I want to do some diagnosis of a disease. I want to predict if my joke is funny or not, whatever. It's a variable. What are the variables that are going to help a prediction of this? It's everything that's in gray. This is called the Markov blanket. So the Markov blanket is just the collection of variables that uh, are connected by bidirected or by paths that have colliders in the middle. So for example, uh, because I, I kind of have a grid approach. So I start with my neighbors and the neighbors are always helping me to do the prediction because they are directly associated to me. So for example, descendants are help uh, are helpful. Uh, those that are just connected by bidirected edges are also helpful and so on. So all the neighbors in the graph are helpful for prediction. But once I observe the value of this neighbor, something else you now can be helpful. So this other variable here, you see that's a collider. It was no longer, it, it was not, not helpful before because it's independent due to this collider. But once I condition on the collider, now it becomes helpful. So in this grid approach where I add the neighbors, then for example, here, now this, they are, they are not, this other variable is now connected to V. And if I add this other, this other variable is connected to V. So this can be very fun. So you, you can have like many, many, many variables being relevant for your prediction. So when you fit a different neural network, okay, let's see what are the variables that are relevant for or uh, having a good contribution for my classification. This doesn't tell much, right? It's just the Markov blanket. I mean, it, it, it tells at least that's in the Markov blanket. But if you're interested in making interventions like, okay, this variable was relevant for me in the prediction. Let's, can, can I now change it and see if I, I have something different later? Not really, right? If you, if you intervene on this, it won't have an effect on V. It was caused by this unmeasured co common cause here. And actually it's not going to affect anything in this graph, it's just contained there. Um, but if you are now intervene on the cause, now you have a difference in the V. So knowing what are the causes actually are necessary, it's a necessary uh, question to make to do, uh, uh, to do decision making, right? Uh, I think I have a bit more time uh, before the break. Uh, I also like to make the uh, the, um, the connection with randomized experiments. Uh, so in, in a randomized experiment, we start with the most simple graph about my graph, uh, my, my model, because I don't have any knowledge about X and Y. I just believe that X has a cause on Y. Uh, I also like to make this point here. When I add a directed edge, doesn't really mean that X is a cause of Y. I'm just giving you the, the giving X the opportunity of helping why because it can be a zero effect here it's just a parameterization of the model so when the causal diagram is defined in the way that i explained to you it's kind of not giving you this right intuition about the parameterization of the all possible models that are represented by this graph but this graph actually uh, not only represents the functions of y that depends on x but also those that doesn't depend on X. The only thing that's happening here is that Y can never be an argument of the function of X. Um, I mean, it's just a super model, right? So it's just containing the one that doesn't have the edge. But anyways, when you have a randomized experiment, your goal is to evaluate if the effect of X on Y is different than zero. That's it. And you don't need to know, like you can actually make, a, uh, you can collapse your graph in just a subset of the variables. You don't need to start with all the variables that you believe that are important. You just get any subset of variables. There's always a projection of it in the subgraph. And uh, this is what's telling here that uh, I have many, many confounders between X and Y. I don't even know how they are creating the, uh, the, the confounding, but they are there. And uh, that, that is a possible uh, uh, a co a causal relationship here from X to Y. And then my randomized control trial, in, in our randomized control trial, I just randomize the X. And the fact that I'm randomizing the X, I'm kind of uh, minimizing or not, I'm not saying removing completely, but it's minimizing all the influence of all these measured confounders on X. 
because x the, the, the fact that x that x was assigned to a person is not long is no longer depending on these other factors u x y it's just a random approach and that's why the the association between x and y is now only due to the directed path to the the, the, the edge that comes from x to y so any difference that you see now from group the the, the control and the case uh, the, the the two groups that you separated in the, the, the experiment it has to be due to x because it's the only way that x and y are associated it cannot be through any confounding path here that's the idea that why randomized control trials give you the causal effect right it's just removing or min minimizing the influence of the confounders um, um okay i want to go to this pro inferential hierarchy before uh the break i think we also have time it's 10 30 around 10 30 right uh so the pearls causal hierarchy or pearls inferential hierarchy tell us tell us that there are actually three different uh types of inferences the associational inferences the interventional inferences and the counterfactual inferences um and uh i i again i i'm going to just give you um an overview what happened between the observational world and the interventional world so from the SEM, we would have completely understanding of it so if you had access to the SEM, you are done there is no even causal inference to do here like it's just a model right uh, so, however, we assume that we don't have access to it because it's too hard, but there is loss of information. And we can actually draw a, a diagram corresponding to the uh, structural causal model. So I explained already, I explained already how, how can we can construct this graph. We also can uh, get the probability distribution from any data that's collected in this passive way in the, in the nature, in the way that it is which is the observational data and the interventional distribution that's induced by the model can also be uh, estimated from observational data. In the interventional world, we also have loss of information. We don't have access to the functions. We don't have access to the distribution of the use. However, we can construct the interventional causal diagram. It's just this diagram where do, we don't have edges in, into X. So it's just a graph where you remove any influence on X because X is now a constant. Uh, and I again again have uh, interventional the, the the distribution that's induced it now is called interventional distribution and the data that can be collected after doing an intervention is interventional data. Um, and if you kind of follow this procedure, right? So again, we have two different roads, and the idea here is that uh, we have we could construct the graph, but usually we have data just from the observational road. Uh, so by understanding so that that's the most simple graph i could collect the data from here that's just the the world as it is i can construct a graph just following any intuition that i have i can construct the interventional graph just cutting the edges into it i could have everything but if i don't have anything that's coming directly from the interventional world what's how can i actually move from this uh, the world where i'm just observing through to this other world where I'm doing. So that's the, 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 the question that we are actually interested in the causal inference uh, um, field. How can we move across two different types of uh, inferences, the ones that are just here in the observational road to the other one in the interventional road? Uh, and why is this hard? This is really hard because actually there is an equivalence it's like if, if you just have data, so I told you that is loss of information, don't longer know what's the graph, what's the, the, the structure causal model, you have any, any idea, no clue about everything what happened before, just have data. And if you try to actually explain an association that you observed, because from data you can only see associations there, conditional independences, conditional dependencies, whatever, but it's just associations. And uh, actually, there are many, many models that explain the same set of associations and condition independences that you observe in the data. Like in this example, just with two variables, if X and Y are correlated, this can be the graph, or this can be the graph. You can generate exactly the same set of condition dependencies using these two different models because it's just X correlated to Y. 
you're not saying if is my example of the fire fires in the fire you don't know before unless you know the underlying model but uh you don't know both have the same conclusion that x is correlated to y or you can have just this spurious association between them just another variable and they are not even uh, uh, cause or uh, related or you can have just x pointing to y without confounding you can have y pointing to x without confounding they are all perfectly representing x correlated to y so if your information is just x correlated to y it's just impossible to pick one of them and actually it's worse each of these graphs as i told you is representing a structural causal model so each of them have a bunch of models that are equivalent to them a bunch so if you want something in the structure causal level causal model level like you want to fit a deep generative model because then you want to generate data from it and you want it through one <laughs> You, you you need to be very 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 lucky because all of them are going to give you an accuracy of 100 percent if you have infinite data all of them so if you run again the training your training you can pick the first if you rerun you can pick the second and if you rerun again you can pick the other you never know if it's the true model you can you can do some evaluation of it but uh, this doesn't mean that your approach was good it's just that you are lucky in the end and maybe you have some similarities and it's possible that you just pick one that is good in 80 percent of the case but why the others why we have hallucinations is because it's not a true model you need to just move to the other but how how can you move to the other it's impossible right unless you add more information that's just not data so just collecting data is good can we just continue collecting data collecting data and just that no can we increase just the model? No, <laughs> that, that's not the point. Actually, with much more variables, there are many, many more possibilities of equivalent models. It's just hard. You need other type of knowledge, experimental data, human in the loop, something that brings other type of data or other type of knowledge, right? To reduce the size of this class of many, many equivalent models, right? Um, oh imagine that I collected all the variables that are relevant in my road <laughs> I went there I have video I have a voice I have the information about your intuition I have everything now it's a Markovian model I have no measured confounder but that is still a class of equivalence here you cannot you cannot believe that you are going to train a model and it's going to be the true one that's going to generate data similar to the one that you just observed unless you have a very good knowledge about what's going on here right and then you reduce and then you, you understand better um so that's the problem multiple neural networks fit the data equally well leading to different causal explanations and that's the letter of causation so in the letter of causation actually it's a way to uh, formalize this idea that uh, we have three different layers so if you have associations only so if you only collected observational uh, data and you have access just to the observational distribution you can use any machine any machine learning model that 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 you like can be just regression can be transformers can be whatever if it's just using observational data the only question that you can answer is about prediction so what if i see right so how would seeing x will change my belief in y so I can answer the question about the firefighters and the fire, the fire. I can guess, I can do prediction, I can do diagnosis, I can do classification with a very good accuracy. But uh, that's different than reasoning, right? And with observational data, I can do this. I, this is sufficient. Just observational data is sufficient to prediction because you just need the Markov blanket, right? Uh, now, if you want to move up in this ladder, and ask about interventions what will happen if i change something you are we will change the outcome now you need a different language now we can use causal bayesian networks the one that i just explained we can use reinforcement learning because now you are doing some experiments there so you need to control these unmeasured confounders that exist to actually have access to the causal effect and this can actually answer questions about what if i do something 
What if what would be what, the value of Y if I intervene on X? You my headache be cured if I take an aspirin. So that's intervention. And look that this is not complete explainability. I'm not saying like what you happen to this person when she actually takes the aspirin. I'm taking, I'm just talking about population of, so in average, we know that the effect or the, the, the difference between taking an aspirin and not taking an aspirin has an effect. So I'm not saying how is the model that generate having the headache and not having the headache in the end. So it's a different layer that, uh, oops, if you actually have this type of question, sorry, uh, it, this question is of about what you happen with me is like an individual level inference. Like this is this is the notation for counterfactual. But imagine that I took the aspirin, and I would I would like to know what would happen if I haven't taken it. So it's now much more than average effect or just the difference between uh, having or not having taken uh, an aspirin is something um, that you would have access, you would need more about the structural causal model. Actually, the structural causal model is, is, it would be able to answer counterfactual uh, variables. Um, so we need much more assumptions to reason about uh, different parallel roads or where uh, in individual level uh, effects. Um, so that's the goal. We want to do cross layer inferences. So usually we have access to just some type of information, the information, for example, in the layer one and move to second layer. That's the, the layer where you do interventions. That's the, the challenges here. Uh, could go to the third layer, layer as well. And we have this uh, theorem actually that says that uh, to answer questions in one specific layer, suppose layer two, we need information from layer two or three is two or higher. You cannot just use information in layer one. So that's why we need the causal diagram or at least some type of information about the causal model to actually infer effects of intervention. You can you you, you can know you cannot know without it without it just data. So if you want to actually have the data generating model, imagine you need information the data generating model, understand? So you cannot just use data. Uh, so I I have this uh, comic uh, here that's XKCD. Uh, I think Imadio gave a, a very nice comic as well in his presentation. Uh, but that's that's really uh, interesting. Uh, it's related to what we discussed. So let me read. Uh, another huge study found no evidence that cell phones cause cancer. Uh, what was the WHO thinking? And then the guy said, mm, I think they just got it backward. Huh? Well, take a look. Then you have a graph that first, so that's a temporal, uh, so it's from, starting in the, night, in the 70s here and to the, the 20, uh, 2010. And then you see that the, the number of the, 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 the cancer incidence is increasing. So first the cancer was increasing. And then the cell phone users increased. So actually the guy is thinking that the cancer is causing the cell phone users. <laughs> and then the guy, mm, no, you are not. There are so many problems with that. And then the guy says, just to be safe until I see more data, I'm going to assume cancer causes cell phones. So the, my question, we will be able to decide the true relationship by just seeing more data. And the guy probably will die before knowing the answer, if it's observational data, of course, right? So if you have experimental data or if you have a type of data, you can answer. So you, it's possible that uh, mobile phones cause cancer can be the other way around, not sure, but could be just a confounder. I think that would be a, plaus a plausible uh, explanation. Like we have now, uh, we, we had technology that help you to detect cancer easily. Also at the same time, the same technology uh, uh, give access uh, to uh, uh, to more cell phones, so people have have uh, it was more affordable. So the increase of both actually was due to just technology, but uh, I don't know. Could be that actually phone causes cancer also with this confounder. We just don't know. It's uh, just looking at data. It's impossible to know. Um, I think I will move forward just because I have more ten minutes. 
uh, just to give you an idea about effect, the tools that, uh, that allow us to do cause effect identification. Those include the graphical criterion that uh, is going to be uh, very easily to uh, read from the graph. Also, we have the calculus and the idea algorithm. I'll, I'll try to at least uh, go uh, at least superficially through these uh, topics. Um, so what is a causal effect first? So usually a causal effect is any quantity uh, that is derived from the interventional distribution. So could be, for example, the average treatment effect. So you see, if you start reading about causal inference, you're going to see this name is so the average treatment effect is usually in the setting of uh, discrete treatments where you have, for example, binary or I don't know, but you have like two levels of a treatment and treatment for us doesn't need to be medication, can be anything. It's just something that you are interested in, it's a variable X. And uh, the difference actually is what you are interested. If you want to know if one level of the variable X uh, gives a different value of Y than than using the other level of X. So the difference of the expectation here uh, is, is, the, is, is, is what we are, uh, is our quantity that, that explains uh, the effect of X on Y. This is just one way of defining causal effect, but the pointer part is that uh, is derived from the interventional distribution, right? Oh, if it's continuous treatments. Oh, we can just take the partial derivative, like if you have a set of variables y and x, is because the derivative shows this is the rate of, of change, right? So it shows how, how moving from one level to the other, you see what's the change in the variable y. So there are many ways, but as long as it is defined by the interventional distribution, you are fine. And that's why we are usually when we say, we say identification of effects, we are actually meaning identification of the interventional distribution. So many times here, I'm just going to say, let's identify probability of Y given to X. And then you can do whatever you want in the end, by if you can, you can take the expectation, you can do whatever you need. Um, so the classical pipeline for, in, 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 for inferring effects of intervention is actually first having a question. So we, it's a carry, the query, then the, the, that's, that's, as I said, is the probability of Y given to X. I'm don't, I don't need to define as the expectation or the differences. Let's just think about the interventional distribution here. Then we need constraints. Those constraints are necessary, as I told you, because otherwise you would have just data and then it's really hard to get to identification of the effect. Uh, so those constraints can come from prior knowledge. We will see later how can you relax a little bit these assumptions here. So those are assumptions. For me, constraints and assumptions are kind of the same because is if it's coming from knowledge and you have uh, uh, and if you are certain that this is correct, then everything later uh, that follow in your pipeline is going to be correct. Uh, but if you're just assuming it to make it, the, the calculation simpler, it's a bit more hard to trust in the end. But of course, everything that's constraining your solution, for me, it's uh, written in a causal diagram. It's an encoder of those assumptions. And uh, we also have as input the probability distribution. As you know here, you, if you see here, I'm not saying about data, I assume that you have the probability distribution. If you don't have access to the probability distribution, you need to, to have data and then estimate the probability distribution. This is another thing. So we usually in causal inference, at least in causal identification, we forget about data. So we can, we can believe that uh, it was well estimated, the probability distribution was well estimated. Later, we are going to estimate the formula, but let's just focus on the analytical derivation of when you have the probability distribution to move from the observational road to the interventional road. That's the task. And then, as I said, that is this inference engine. I, it's a black box right now, but I, I'm going to, uh, to break this black box during this lecture. That's the goal of, her, of it. And then in the end, we're going to have a solution. It's possible that your solution is no, because as I said, you can put kind of no constraints here and then you have no identifiability. But if you gave, if you gave me a lot of uh, knowledge and this is sufficient, like in this case, you'll be able to actually write your probability, the interventional distribution, just in terms of the available distributions, which in this case is just the observational. 
uh, but uh, you have this mapping that uh, you just used what you, what you have, and then you can write the goal, that's the interventional distribution, you can have an answer, so you could map. Then you can estimate the terms later using data again, but that's the part that we're going to focus right now. Okay, how can you do this mapping? Um, so that's just the structure knowledge that uh, we assume that's going to be available right now. Let's change in, in the end, we are going to see how to relax this. Um, so that's very complicated. I think I won't I won't read it completely, but the, I, I want to see you the picture. So basically, the point is there are many, many modules, as I said, that they are equivalent. And they if let's assume that they are all inducing the same graph and the same observational distribution. Those are my input, right? So I said that doesn't matter what's the model that generated my data. That's my causal diagram, and that's my probability distribution. Of course, there are many, many modules that would do exactly the same thing. And identifiability is when uh, we will have just one interventional distribution in the end. It's, it, it's unique. So you, in, in words, causal effect identifiability means that it doesn't matter what's the true causal diagram. The models, all the models that have this causal diagram and have this observational distribution, you have this same one interventional distribution. Okay, so it, it, that's the task. It, it seems hard, but it's not. I just told you one example where you actually got the mapping. And there are many examples where you get the mapping and uh, and that's very fortunate because you, you don't need to do any type of assumptions unless the, 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 the causal diagram that you can say that's too much, but uh, basically, you don't need to write the functions. You don't need to say that's my distrib the distribution of my U variables is Gaussian, no Gaussian. Anyways, it, it, it's less knowledge that I'm requiring. That's the important part. So if you if you, if you want another picture about identifiability, basically, if you have all models inducing the observational distribution being in yellow and all models inducing the same graph being in blue, they, they are not the same, right? But they have an overlap. And if everything in the overlap, they also agree with the same probability of y given to x, then it's the identific identifiable case. But if there is at least one model that uh, wouldn't agree, then the whole thing is not identifiable because since you cannot pick the right one, you can it could be the one that didn't work, right? So you, you cannot say anything. So that's uh, that sometimes we, we have this no answer in the pipeline saying that the effect is not identifiable. Um, I think, it, uh, so those are, are kind of the tools that I'm going to, uh, to, to, to explain. The first one is the truncated factorization in the uh, potential outcome framework that, that's the same formula is known as the DG computation formula. And it works when you have no unmeasured confounders, as I said, it's the Markovian case. Um, then we you move to some graphical criteria that's called the parent adjustment, the backdoor adjustment, and the front door adjustment. Those are um, for semi-Markovian models, so it's no longer assuming that you have no unmeasured confounders. You can have unmeasured confounders, but you need to be in the setting of the conditions to apply the graphical criteria. So they are more interesting, but they are also constrained. So uh, it, it, it's not general. And then we are going to move to the do calculus and the ID algorithm. That's actually works for any graph that you can construct. So they are really general. Uh, so they work for any semi-Markov models and you can apply the tool. Those are complete tools, which means that if, if the algorithm tell us that, tell, tells you that uh, the effect is not identifi identifiable is because that exists indeed a model that's there in the equivalence class and the effect is different from the other right so it's not an impossibility of the method that we can try harder no no it's impossible so you need to ch change the input uh, with that input it's in kind of impossible and every time that's that that exists is an identification formula you you get it the algorithm is going to give you the answer so those are the reference i'm going to stop here and uh, we can go to the break i guess it's a uh, right time <laughs>
Bom, um, voltando, uh, volt <laughs> coming, the Brazilians and Portuguese understand me. <laughs> okay, um, let's go back here. So um, I want to go briefly over this topic so we can actually see a bit more uh, about what's happening in, in the field also besides the basic stuff. So, uh, but I, I want you at least to uh, to go at, until the back door because uh, I, I think it's a very simple tool that's really helpful and uh, you can do already a lot uh, just by knowing this. Uh, then I will probably go a little bit faster with the others and then we move forward to other topics. But uh, let's start. Uh, so if you remember, if you, we don't assume, uh, if, you, if you, we assume actually that uh, we measured all the possible confounders, so there's no unmeasured confounders, then we are under the scenario that we call Markovian modules. And identification in Markovian modules is pretty easy. Basically, we have this uh, truncated, trun truncated factorization. You don't need to uh, be scared for uh, with it. But basically, it just says that, um, uh, so you see that that is this x, uh, the subscript here x, is just another way to write uh, the, the do x. So the interventional distribution under the do x can be written like this. And the factor, it's just that it, you see that the subscript is still here and uh, the distribution factorizes according to the parents, right? So we just need to write the, the joint distribution as the product of the conditionals uh, when we con just condition on the parents because all the parents are observed. So there is nothing to uh, condition other, other than just the parents. And uh, so this just follows the, the property of being Markovian. Uh, then also, uh, because we don't have a measured confounders, we have a, a, a property that's called, called modularity. And it, under this property, we can basically replace the interventional distribution with just the observational distribution. So the probability, the conditional probability of the variable given the parents in the interventional distribution is the same as the conditional probability of the variable given the parents in the observational distribution. So because this is true for every variable, we can just replace. So you see that there is no x uh, here uh, in the second line. And, uh, and then that's the joint. So we just sum over everything that's not part of the y and just we just get an expression just in terms of the observational distribution for the uh, interventional distribution. So you see that actually this works for every X and every Y, as long as, uh, uh, and just having the observational distribution. So every causal effect in the Markovian model is identifiable, right? It's a very uh, strong assumption, but you see in the end, you can identify everything. Uh, and then uh, in the in the field, as I told you, uh, this factorization is also known as manipulation theorem, uh, and then RG computation by Robbins here. So it's a uh, uh, it is very well known. It's uh, 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 there is no secret here. So if it's Markovian, everything is identifiable, and just need to compute the factoris the truncated factorization. Um, so as an example here, uh, suppose that I have this graph. So I have no bidirected edges, right? So there's no unmeasured confounders. And uh, so we know that this factorizes according to the parents, as you know, probably from Bayesian networks. But if we compute the interventional graph, that's just cutting the edges into the X, we can just get the same factorization. That's the truncated factorization. And we get the joint. Uh, so. Uh, here, we just cut the arrows into the X, and we can compute the probability of Y and Z given to X just by a product of every variable. So just the Z and the Y, so they are, they are the other variables given their parents. So no parent for Z, Y has X and Z as parents. So it's just computing like this. That's the joint, right? But then we can compute the probability of Y just marginalizing Z. It's pretty simple. Uh, so this works all the time. Uh, just like this. Uh, but in semi-Markovian models, it's a bit more uh, challenging. So uh, we have one pretty, pretty, uh, pretty simple uh, graphical criterion that's called adjustment over parents, 
we actually make one assumption that's not the same as saying that there's no unmeasured confounders at all, but we have no unmeasured parents. So if you have no unmeasured parents, basically you can just do, you see that this is pretty similar as before. So uh, you, you just need to get the parents. So you just uh, marginalize over their parents and add, add the parents uh, in the, so it's always like this. So this expression is called adjustment. So it, it always looks like this. So it's the sum over the conditional of Y, X, and the parents of X, and multiply by the probability of the parents. So once you know that all the parents of X, you can just compute the effect of X on Y by computing this expression. And this works all the time. Uh, this follows directly from the truncated factorization. It's pretty simple. Um, this is an example. So for example, we have some measured confounders now. So you see some uh, bidirected ads, but with the parents of X, they are all observed. So there is no uh, a measured uh, parent here confounding Z2, for example, or Z1. So all the parents are uh, observed. And under this condition, uh, so I have here, the parents are all observed, Z1 and Z2. We can just put the, in the, into the formula and that's it. You just have the probability of Y given to X as this adjustment here, right? So probability of Y given X, the parents are Z1, Z2, multiply the probability of Z1, Z2, which are the parents. Again, nothing crazy. Um, so what is the idea here? Uh, the idea is that uh, when we condition on these parents, basically we are cutting or like uh, we are adjusting for or accounting for everything that, uh, uh, could uh, create a, a spurious association between X and Y. Because if you see in this graph, X and Y, as I told you through the separation, are associated by every path that's unblocked, right? So the first path is the directed path, X pointing to Y. And that's the path that we are interested in because it's the causal effect that we're looking for. However, you see that there is this path that's open, if we don't condition on anything, this is open. Also, that is uh, it's the only one open. So this path creates a confounding. And if you condition on Z1 and Z2, you basically block the path here. By conditioning on Z1, you block this path here. Uh, you kind of don't open anything more. And that's fine. So basically, oh no, when you condition on Z1, you open this collider here. So in this case, you, you would, yeah, but that's fine as well because then there is a collider here. So even conditioning on Z1, you wouldn't uh, open this path. So to be honest, I, I would just need to condition on Z1 to be fine here. But since the Z1 and Z2 are always uh, measured, they are always with a tail here. So condition on the parents, parents never hurt. That, that's the point. You, you always can block every path that's a confounding path because con, con, creates this association through something that's not causal. And if we, if we condition on such parents, we always block this inf, the, the influence of such paths. And then in the end, this expression here is just giving us the effect through these directed paths. That's the point of it. Uh, but again, like it's, do you know if you have all the parents? That's a question. So suppose that that's my graph. And then actually you don't have the parent of X, which is the UXZ2. So it's a variable that's here, it's hidden. It's a parent of X, it's also a parent of Z2 and it's a measure, it's, you don't have it. So you, you would have actually a bidirected edge here. Uh, and then, if what you do, I don't know what, what you can do. Basically, can I just condition on the variables that are close to the y, to the x, the neighbors of x, just blindly get this? What do you happen if I do this? Any guess? We can do the same uh, reasoning here. So after conditioning on Z1 and Z2, now conditioning on Z1, you actually open this collider here. Now conditioning on Z2, you also open this other collider, and now there is this open path. So when you compute this formula here, 
you are not getting just the effect through this directed edge. You are getting the, 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 the association of X and Y as the, 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 the composition of both. The, the effect through this path gets in red and also this path that's directed. So you're not getting the, the causal effect. You're getting just number that represents the association of X and Y and this association is confounded and we don't want that. So uh, to account this, po this, this possibility, we have another criterion that's called backdoor adjustment. And uh, we will use exactly this idea that I told you about blocking these confounding paths. So let's assume that we have a set of treatment variables X, a set of outcome variables Y as before. And we are looking for the set Z that uh, for every, uh, every path that's between a variable in X and a variable in Y, we have to see if this set Z blocks all these paths. Just the confounding paths is a path that has an arrow into X, right? So if it enters into X and it's not going out of X, then this path creates a confounding and we need to block it. Um, so these paths are called confounding paths or backdoor paths. The second condition is this set Z cannot be a descendant of X. It's just... Uh, all the variables have to be pretreatment because if you condition on the, on the descendant, you can actually induce bias. So we cannot uh, do it. So if you find this set, the set Z that blocks all the backdoor paths and also has no descendants of X, then this set Z is called a, a set of covariates or admissible for adjustment. Uh, those are actually the variables that you should always uh, adjust for, for example, if you're running uh, some regression analysis and you want to find the good predictors for it without inducing any bias, those actually are the good variables to adjust for. Those are the variables that, uh, that are creating confounding and you should adjust for. Uh, but you shouldn't adjust for any other variable that are, that are inducing more association, for example, through these open paths that I explained before. Um, so uh, if you find this, you see it's the same adjustment. It's the same formula as before. It's just the probability of Y given X and Z. And then I sum over uh, the, I, I weight uh, by multiplying the probability of Z here. So that's the example from before. So in our example, uh, what would be the good covariate sets for us? Uh, so actually just Z1, I actually told you before. So if you have just Z1, you block this path that was open. And even though it's open in this collider, it doesn't matter because this is already blocked and that's fine. So Z1 blocks all my confounding paths. So if I replace Z here as just the Z1, it works. Uh, what about Z1 and Z3? That's also fine because this, this was already blocking when I add Z3 this is open in this collider, but uh, that's already blocked in this other triplet. So it doesn't hurt. So I could also do Z1, Z3 if you want. Don't need, but you could do it. But what about Z1, Z2, and Z3? So if you just get all my variables in my data set, suppose that I collected the data for Z1, Z2, and Z3, and I blindly decided to just adjust for all of those, it's going to be wrong. So you cannot blindly just get all the variables in your data set and adjust for and expect that you're going to see an unbiased effect of X on Y, right? So you are opening this path here if you uh, adjust uh, condition on all of three. Uh, the same as before, I told you this one, the two doesn't work. That's the example from before. So you need to be very careful when you apply this adjustment. You cannot blindly get the, Z, the set Z you should use some graphical criteria like this. Uh, there are other techniques, but if you are interested, we can discuss more. Uh, but the point is uh, that, that that only works, so that adjustment only works when the set satisfies the backdoor criteria, okay? Um, so when this happens, so when we actually find a set Z that satisfies the either the parent adjustment or the backdoor adjustment. So those are two possibilities for you to look at the, the set and see uh, if those are actually uh, sufficient to make Z as admissible for backdoor adjustment. Then uh, we, we have the effect that's through this formula, right? Like in this graph, we could use Z as Z1 and Z3. 
And uh, that is a trick to actually do a, a more efficient estimation that's called, uh, 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 I mean, we are going to use this technique that is going to identify this propensity score. And the technique uh, uh, um, uh, is basically doing the, the following, we basically multiply here by one, right? So basically we are completing the joint uh, in the numerator. So this so by multiplying by the probability of x given z in the numerator and in the denominator, just multiplying by one doesn't hurt. But in the numerator here, we will get the joint. And then, so this is just the joint. And then the denominator is called a propensity score. And this, when x is, um, uh, so basically you, you are just estimating what's the propensity of getting a treatment given some set of covariates. So you can estimate this by um, uh, any any cut. I mean, if you assume that your treatment is binary, for example, you can just use some classification approach, like I, I, I'm, I'm going to receive or not the treatment given the set of covariates. So it's kind of something that's already in the context that we are uh, used to do. Uh, when X is continuous, is more challenging, but that there are some techniques that uh, work for it. That is a huge literature just about fixing the problem as a, a backdoor adjustment. So you assume a priority that uh, your graph or your set of covariates are already satisfying the backdoor adjustment and just focusing on this estimation. You should be careful with it because you shouldn't assume. You should investigate actually if the set of covariates is actually admissible for backdoor adjustment. But if it is, you are really, really in a good place because there are many, many techniques that are helpful to estimate this formula in a very efficient way. Uh, in, in, in the field, uh, in, we have actually an equivalence. So uh, the pros uh, framework of causality uh, is, is, is more about showing these uh, assumptions or constraints about the models in a graphical approach. But that is also another framework. Maybe you have heard about that. That's, that's uh, propensity score. Uh, sorry, it's the potential outcome framework. And... Uh, the same idea that we, we see as backdoor adjustment is equivalent. So we in the field of potential outcome framework, we are you, you see as an assumption saying we are under the under the conditional ignorability assumption or conditional exchange ability assumption. Sometimes those two names are, are appear in the literature. And this actually means that the uh, potential outcome of, of Y. Uh, given that you did an intervention on X is, in, is independent of, of, of the treatment X given Z. Uh, so I, I, I think any no, no human actually could understand this. It's really weird. Uh, but that, that's the, the point, like in the potential outcome framework, everything is in terms of potential uh, the potential response or the potential outcome. And that is an equivalence though that... Uh, when you assume the condition ignorability given the set Z, you are actually assuming that the set Z is admissible for backdoor adjustment. And I think it's pretty easier to, to do through backdoor adjustment using the graph to know if Z is actually satisfying the condition ignorability assumption without having a graph, it's kind of hard, or without having a condition that uses uh, some properties of, uh, of the graph, it's really hard. Uh, but uh, if you if you are under the scenario, you can uh, do this uh, uh, this technique. This technique is also called inverse inver inverse probability weighting or propensity score. And then you can efficiently estimate the probability of y given to x because it's just estimating this formula actually. Okay. Um, so, uh, but what if backdoor adjustment doesn't work? So uh, we have other graphical criteria. Uh, for example, that is this front door. Uh, this front door tells us now about uh, a set M. This at set M now is a mediator set. So it has to intercept all the directed paths between X and Y. Uh, other condition is that cannot have unblocked backdoor paths between X and M. And all backdoor paths between M and, and Y have to be blocked by X. So you just need to follow those conditions. And if that exists is the M, then you have a completely different formula. Like you carefully, you can read this. I think it's kind of just showing that there are other graphical criteria that you can use. Of course, each of them are going to require different property in the graph. 
so for example, this is the traditional front door graph. You, you always see this graph when you read about the front door because it's explaining in, a, in the, the minimal way how can you uh, satisfy the, 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 the criteria just with the, the set of M, the set of the set M being the variable M because M intercepts all the directed paths between X and M. So you can have some confounding you see that there is a confounding between X and Y. So it doesn't work, backdoor doesn't work. But you could have just a mediator and this mediator, as long as it's not confounded in this side, and sorry, it's not confounding, yes, in this side, and the effect of M on Y is just uh, conditioning on X, you block this backdoor path here. So it's basically, it's a composition of the effect of X on M and the effect of M on Y. Uh, it's just a graphical criteria. It's just another way of computing the effect. So for example, in this case, it works. Uh, if you have many directed paths, as long as you can find a set that blocks all the directed paths, it also works. Um, but uh, if you cannot block all the directed paths, now it doesn't work anymore. If you have a confounding here, as I said, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, that, that's getting hard because now we need like a graphical criteria for every graph that we are going to create now. It's, it cannot be like this, right? So that's the point. There are many scenarios uh, beyond back door and front door. That is the condition of front door where you can actually block the confounding through some condition or some, some sets. Uh, and then you have a different formula. It's different from that one. But you can have the napkin. Napkin is another very famous graph that, that has this appearance here. And then the effect is just these fractions. Getting a monster, right? Uh, that you, you can put your name now in this one. There is no name for this. But it's another formula. So what, uh, what can we do now? It's kind of crazy. We will have like a graphical criteria for each of them. Of course not. Uh, that's why we have the do calculus. Uh, the do calculus is simple, just three rules. <laughs> it's not that simple, to be honest. To apply those rules, it's a bit kind of uh, hard. Sometimes you need to be really creative. Uh, but the idea is that uh, you can apply these rules as a way uh, to to change, like you can detect some invariances between the interventional distribution and the observational distribution. So for example, the rule one, you can remove the observation on X. So basically it's like an independence. Uh, so Y being independent of X, but now we have this do operator. It's like extending the conditional independence to the uh, interventional distribution. Uh, the second rule allows you to change a do to just an observational uh, X. So applying an intervention on X is the same as a, a observing X. And the third one is when you remove completely an action. So the do X can be removed here. And you see here that in the right side, the conditions are some graphical uh, conditions. They depend on some graphs that are, we call it manipulation. So we have this GW bar, which we remove the arrows into uh, W, the X underline, we remove the arrows and they're uh, after, going after, uh, out of X. I mean, I, I won't go over it because it's more like an educational tool. You, you kind of uh, uh, basically can derive, like this is what you have to do, like in the front door scenario. You can derive that, that formula that you saw in the end by applying uh, the rules in a sequential way. Uh, and you see, you should have like, be, you have to be creative because you need to, to see how you go from uh, one line to another line, just using some probability properties, the rules of the do calculus. But in the end, if you have like an expression that's completely uh, in terms of observational, uh, conditional probabilities in the observational distribution, so you see there is no do here. So we call it a do free expression. So if you, if you could, derive in, in using a sequence of applications, if in the end you could derive an expression that's completely do free, then you get identifiability. So you're fine, but uh, it's kind of hard, right? So when I have to stop, 
I, I don't know, right? Maybe it's just uh, it's just too hard. So in Prezi, we don't use the do calculus, but uh, I mean, I, I think they are really nice to know because they it gives you the intuition about what's happening in, uh, in, in, in this derivation. But uh, in the reality, actually, we have the identify or ID algorithm um, that uh, basically it, it, it it doesn't follow the idea of the do calculus, but it, it 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 could prove that the do calculus is complete, and that's what we do in reality. So again, I, I won't go over the algorithm. If you are interested, we can talk later. Uh, it's not that hard, uh, but it, it is an algorithm. So someone had to prove how each line here makes sense, and also have to prove that uh, this is complete. And the point is, this is our black box there in our pipeline. We run this algorithm and we have, and it's a complete algorithm. So in the end, if you have an, an answer, he, this algorithm is going to give to you, right? So that's the inference engine that I told you, the ID algorithm. There are actually many generalizations of it. So here, it's, that it's just about getting the observational distribution. So one observational distribution, but uh, that's the classical one. It was by Pro, uh, by Jing Tian and Pro in 2002. This was his PhD thesis, uh, really impressive PhD thesis. Uh, and he derived this and many other things. Uh, but today we have many, many other uh, extensions of this ID algorithm. For example, combining observational and experimental data, or when sometimes you have interventions that are soft interventions. And we have also this uh, estimation through deep neural networks. I would like to just give you uh, an idea because I think we are here really uh, interested in deep neural networks. And I guess you show how uh, we have this connection. So uh, let's let's see. So basically, as you saw before, we, we have the true model and it's there, it exists. Uh, and we can induce a causal diagram. You already know it. So this method is going to assume that you have a causal diagram, right? So then it's going to use the causal diagram to construct a neural network, but it's not one neural network. It's one neural network per edge in the graph. So you, you see here, so that's really simple. You have just one variable. Later, you see that we can have some generalizations where you, you can work with clusters and stuff like this. But basically, the idea is that you, you induce, you make the deep neural network to learn a method that's, that's satisfying at least this structure. So you, Z is going to be a function of X. So Z is a neural network that depends on X and also depends on some uh, variable that, uh, uh, that, that, that depends here, like you remember, right? So every Z has a U variable pointing to it, so it also has here. So uh, you feed a neural network just to learn Z from its parent, uh, including the U here. Uh, the, um, the Y variable now, the Y variable, it forms a clique with the X. And this confounding has to be accounted for as well. So we have to, to, to create, so that's what's written here. So uh, every U that, that's, that's part of a, a clique, uh, you, you're going to kind of assume some distribution for it. So for example, a uniform. So you generate an uniform for it, uh, a, a uniform distribution for it, and you create artificially this variable. And this is going to be a parent of X, right? Because that's what X is, depends on this, U, X, Y. And the Y is going to depend on the U, X, Y, and the Z, right? So that's the same here. But the point is, uh, we are going to use inductive bias based on the causal diagram. So we enforce these constraints. Uh, okay, that's, that's good. And what I have with this, so in the end, the true model actually as I told you, it induces the three different probability distributions that we can get. So it induces the observational distribution, it induces the interventional distribution, and it also induces the counterfactual distribution. I didn't explain this to you, but it's there, and everything follows from the structure causal model. In the, and the, this actually induces the causal diagram. And then we have we are training this proxy, I would say. It's a different model. We don't know it, uh, but it's like a M a hat. And this is inducing some other distributions, the L1, the L2, and L3 distributions. It's a different one. 
the L1 is going to be the same because it's just training, right? So we can fit, we know already that the L1 distributions can be uh, equivalent by it. And the L2, uh, basically, that's the question. What can we say about it? Is the same or not? Uh, any of you can tell me uh, when actually this happens? So I have two different models. When I have the, the, the same interventional distribution. So I just explaining I just explained to you what's the concept of identifiability. Doesn't matter what are the models. They are going to have the same interventional distribution. So uh, if they, they induce the same PV, the same probability dis observation distribution, and they induce the same causal diagram I constructed, so by design, both of them have the same probability distribution, same observational, observ observational distribution, and induce the same causal diagram. So as long, like I, I only have the same interventional distribution if the effect is identifiable, right? And what is identifiability? Is when everyone in the class, in the equivalence class, has the same interventional distribution. So I, I only can say that they have the same L2 if everyone that's possible to be chosen here, like every model that I could fit there, you have in the end the same interventional distribution. That's the idea for them. Like a, I mean, that's just expressive. It is that is a theorem that says that uh, uh, it's possible to find. So just a, a matter of that, uh, uh, are you find uh, an M, uh, M hat that's going to match? And matching doesn't mean that they are the same, right? So matching the interventional distribution doesn't mean that the models are the same. It's just matching the interventional probability. Actually, you can even match the counterfactual distribution without being the same model. That's That's hard, but that exists. But that exists, uh, like deep neural networks actually are express, uh, it's expressive enough to actually find these models that are going to match the intervention or the counterfactual distribution. And the algorithm actually uses like a, a trick because if you are just fitting this M hat, right? We are just looking this M hat, that's the neural causal model. We are fitting a model and then we compute What's the minimal uh, probability of Y given to X and the maximum probability of Y X? It's like an optim optimiz op optimization approach. And uh, so the L1 is always the same, but the L2 is going to be the same if the minimum and the maximum actually, actually are the same. Because this means that uh, you, you kind of went through all these possible models, you got the minimum, you got the maximum, and if they are the same, it's because everyone has the same interventional probability. So that's what they do. Like they, they identify, they, they, they find so a way, it's a, another way to identify an effect through neural, neural networks. And uh, actually, it, they do more than just the identifiability because you already have a model that can give you what's the probability of Y given the X. Uh, so you can just get the M hat. Again, M hat is not the true data generating model. You cannot get the model that was fit, generate data, and uh, as a, a deep generative model, you cannot use it as the true data generating model, but you can actually get the probability of Y given to X for this specific X and this specific Y and say, okay, the value that this M hat is giving to me is the same as the M star, the true causal model. Okay, it's the only connection that we can have right now through uh, for, for getting identifiability and uh, estimation. Uh, okay, uh, so I I want to actually before uh, in, in the end of the lecture I want to go over a, a bit of uh, some of my research because I, I I so my field of research is more about relaxing the assumption. So many of you would kind of say, oh, okay, everything looks very interesting, but uh, in practice, how can you actually get a causal diagram? And 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 you you were saying in the beginning that is pretty hard to, to trust the assumptions in a, uh, in, a, in a fully specified structure causal model. But what about the specification of a causal diagram? If you have five variables, maybe I can do it. But what about like 10 variables or if I have no clue about what's happening? 
So uh, that's what I'm doing. So I, I want to relax the second input of uh, this pipeline uh, because sometimes it's really hard to specify. Uh, then um, I'm just skipping here, but the question is, is it possible to relax the assumption of having a fully specified causal diagram and still be able to identify a causal effect? And the answer is yes. Uh, so basically we use the idea of clusters. So you don't need to use just you, you don't need to specify now uh, the causal diagrams at the variable level you can specify it in a cluster level uh, and these clusters are uh, um, yeah so suppose for example the diagram cannot be specified and that, that's the question so the clusters are kind of a partition they have to form a partition of your variables and they are created in a way that you kind of understand the relationship among the clusters but you cannot you, you you don't you don't know or there is no consensus in the field to actually uh, orient if, uh, the or, uh, get the orientations among the variables within the cluster. So it is just a way to construct like macro variables and think about this ver these clusters of variables as another variable. Uh, so how do you construct this? So basically we have an arrow from a cluster to another, as long as you would have at least one variable in the cluster pointing to another variable in another cluster, right? So we are relaxing kind of, we are getting like the most weak uh, model because basically we are allowing the, the connection for any variable here to the, to the other cluster. So, I mean, uh, we can discuss this better, but the idea is just if at least at least one variable that, that could potentially affect one variable in another cluster, then you add an arrow. So when the, and the, the cluster can have just one variable. So X pointing to S, S pointing to Y, suppose that I know this, but I just don't know the, what's happening in the cluster A, B, C, D. And if I have like any variable there pointing to X, I have to add. If I have no variable pointing to S, then I don't add. But if I have a variable pointing to Y, I have to add. So something like this. Uh, what about confounding? Confounding is, again, the same thing. If you have any variable there that could be confounded with another variable in another cluster, you add a bidirected edge between the clusters like this or this. Okay. Uh, so what is, and again, we assume all the same things. This is just a causal diagram over macro variables. Uh, and Again, this is just increasing kind of instead, instead of now a causal diagram being a class of a, a bunch of structural causal models, actually it's now a class of more causal diagrams because you are allowing all the possible combinations of relationships among the variables within the cluster. And also you are allowing all of them to, to, to follow the same type of relationship across the cluster. So there are many, many, many more causal diagrams, but this comes from the fact that you have no knowledge to actually specify at the variable level. So the, the point is, can we now uh, infer an effect without deciding on uh, any of one particular causal diagram? So I, I have to infer the effect for the class, right? And uh, actually we, we have this, uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the, 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 the idea of creating clusters could it, it's actually, uh, it, you can consider this as just uh, a flex, uh, creating a flexible way of encoding the model assumption. So if you have assumption, it's a structural assumption about every variable, every pair of variable, you would actually reduce the problem to a simple uh, causal diagram. But if you have any um, uncertainty about what's happening between some variables, then you put them in a cluster. If you have no knowledge about anything, you would have one cluster and then there's nothing, right? That's just a bunch of variables together. So uh, that's that's what's happening. And these clusters are usually created to just lack of knowledge or also help to communicate better uh, the relationship because sometimes we don't care much about some variables. You actually care about the, the connection between groups of variables. And anyways, but the point is we actually extended all the tools necessary to do identification with it. So the separation, uh, the calculus and the idea algorithm, they, they actually work pretty well with this new way of constructing causal diagrams. You can just replace the DAG to a CDAG now and that is going to work, okay? Uh, and what about the fact that the identifiability? So we are going to have identification when actually everything works in every member of the class 
can be identifiable through the same way. So for example, if in this case, we have adjustment, we just saw the backdoor adjustment. So you don't need to think about blocking all backdoor paths as you have just one big cluster. Kind of this is the setting that people have in the condition ignorability because you don't think about the relationship, about the, the covariates, but you just put everything together and you just create one confounding path. So in this case, if a condition on the cluster, you are not going, the, the separation follows kind of the same thing. So you can use your intuition here. Basically, if you condition on the cluster, you are going to block this path. So the adjustment works. And this means that doesn't matter what's happening between the variables within the cluster. So as long as this is kind of all the parents are observed, you could have even a bidirected in this, this size here and would block the backdoor path. And that's the special case where you actually observed all the parents in the left size and the adjustment works, right? Um, also, what about this case now? So this case actually tell us when conditioning inability fails because it's going to fail and when it's going to fail, you just need one, only one variable that's confounded with X and only one variable that's confounded with Y. What's the chance of this happening? It's kind of huge, but uh, unfortunately that's showing that uh, if that's your knowledge, if you have no knowledge about uh, saying that uh, at least all the parents of X are measured or all the parents of Y are measured, then you cannot use adjustment. Of, you, you, you would need to open up and see uh, if it actually conditioning on everything would work. But just having the, the knowledge that they are pretreatment, like you just collected a, ver a, a bunch of variables that are just before X and you don't know anything about confounding, this would be a case. And it's not identifiable. Like this is a case where you would open up this path through this bidirected edge if you if you condition on both Z1 and Z2. Uh, of course, there are cases that works, but you don't know, right? So you cannot pick this one. So that's the point. So it's not going to be identifiable because it's, it, it exists at least one model where this wouldn't be identifiable. Uh, of course, there are many more models beyond backdoor adjustment. Like this would work for any graphical criteria that you're used to, like you could apply back uh, front door like this uh, and, and so on, even the idea algorithm. So what if you have no knowledge, no, not, a, not even to construct a, a, a cluster causal diagram? Then uh, we would, we, that's the question. Can we learn a causal diagram from observational data? And yes, um, I mean, not really. <laughs> Uh, we can't learn the true causal diagram. I mean, that's that was where we started with. We said that uh, just from data, it's impossible to get the 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 layer two representation of the model, right? So it would be like moving from layer one to layer two would be have identifiability of the causal diagram. Uh, uh, to to have identifiability of the causal diagram, we would have to add more assumptions. That's the point. But just from data, and uh, you don't assume anything about your error terms or the function relationships, anything, we usually can learn up to equivalence class. It's just a representation of all those models that are equivalent. And we have one algorithm, I would say that's the most classical one, that's called the fast causal inference algorithm. It, it can deal also with uh, potential latent confounders. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a variation of the PC algorithm, if you, if you have heard about it, but the, the PC assumes causal sufficiency. Then the fast causal inference comes a bit later, uh, uh, relaxing the assumption of having no unmeasured confounder. So it can deal with a measured confounder. So it, it was proposed uh, actually in 2001, but in 2008, uh, uh, Jin, uh, Jin Zhang uh, show uh, a set of 10 rules that basically uh, shows and also shows completeness of this algorithm. So under some uh, basic assumptions that I'm going to show you, you, you can actually recover a representation of this entire class of models. Uh, so let's just see a little bit how it works. Uh, we have basically the goal is to learn a graphical representation of the Markov equivalence class. So we call this class of equivalent models as Markov equivalence class. And we will have uh, two assumptions. The first one is that uh, 
that exists actually a graph that can uh, represent all the conditional independences in your distribution in the sense that everything that you observed as this separation in the graph is going to imply a conditional independence in the probability distribution. So that is this correspondence. It's called semi-Markov semi condition, or it's sometimes called as IMAP or perfect IMAP. I mean, but means that uh, that exists as a graph where all the condition independences that are implied by it actually exists in the probability distribution. And the, um, the second condition is this faithfulness. This is a bit more delicate. It's saying that uh, everything that you observe or that ev every independence in your condition in your probability distribution actually is true in the underlying causal model. Um, and I say that's a bit delicate because usually we don't have access to P. If you have access to P, then it would be fine. But you don't have access to P. Usually, uh, we use data to estimate P. And from P, uh, from data to P, you, you, you may not be able to recover perfectly this P. And you have like some condition independences that are false or they are uh, like false positives, false, false negatives. Uh, so this assumption is a bit tricky, but we are, I mean, this is an assumption that happens in any uh, statistical method, right? So we, we are going to assume that what you observed in the data, it's actually faithful to the probability distribution. So you can use the data actually to infer the probability distribution. And, and because of this, we need to adequate uh, condition independence tests, like something that's really reliable. Uh, but then... Uh, the, the object that's going to be the output of this uh, algorithm with this representation of the equivalence class is going to be a peg. This peg is actually a partial ancestor graph. I'm going to explain later, but this object is going to have, a, uh, under those assumptions, is going to have like a perfect equivalence in the sense that everything that you observe in the peg as M separation, I'm not going to explain you, but you can actually look at this uh, paper that we define M separation, uh, where you actually, everything that you, that you, all M separation is going to be inducing, uh, or all M separation is actually associated to a probability, a conditional independence in the probability distribution, and also this separation in the causal diagram, the true causal diagram, and also something, and also the the the, the reverse. Like if exists a separation in the graph in the true underlying graph or in the or independence in the probability distribution, this is going to be represented in the peg. Um, so we actually in this graph, um, I think it's better to go through, through the examples first. But basically, it's a partial uh, specified graph. And in the, in, in, we will have some circles. The circles, they mean no invariance, which means that uh, there are some models in this equivalence class that the, the edge mark could be something else. Uh, so you, 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 every time that you have an invariance, so, so for example, you have an arrowhead in all members of the equivalence class, then you are going to have an arrowhead in the peg. So if every member in the equivalence class has a tail there in this edge, then you're going to have a tail in the peg. So you only learn those invariances. So you only learn those that are actually appearing in all members of the equivalence class. And uh, tail actually means ancestrality. Uh, arrowhead, so like it doesn't matter what's here in A, could be a circle, but that that's informative already because C say that B is a known ancestor of A. When you have two arrowheads like this, uh, this means that A and B are just spurious, uh, spurious uh, associated. Spurious associated means that A is not ancestor of B, B is not ancestor of A, right? And you, you can actually have a, a way to detect the selection bias, so association through selection bias. So suppose that you collect the data uh, only uh, uh, for uh, children, I don't know. Then you are kind of making a selection bias because you you are conditioning on the level of the variable age or, or age range, something like this. And some conditioning on this, actually you'll be conditioning on a collider. So you can actually induce some associations between two variables just because you have selection bias. So uh, the algorithm can detect associations with it, about it. So uh, 
you you can go over the list of some condition dependencies. There are many more uh, available, but uh, the point is you need if you are going to learn the probability distribution for film data, which is almost the case. You need a good condition dependence test, and this depends on the type of your variables. Like if you assume that everything's Gaussian and independent, then you can use the partial correlation test. Oh, I don't want to assume anything. Okay, you can use a kernel basic no non-parametric test. Uh, oh, I have mixed variables. I have continuous, I have a discrete all the same time. So you can use some other variables. Oh, I have correlation among my, my observations. Okay, you can use some other variable or other condition dependence tests. So you need to find a, a perfect condition dependence test for your case. That's the point. And, uh, uh, and how actually they learn these invariances, right? So I, I said that uh, these algorithms are all about learning invariances. So basically, the, the data is what you have. So it can come from many, many models. You don't know it. But you learn through this condition dependence test is that X is independent of Y, for example. You also find several dependencies. So that's the only conditional independence that you could find. If you were like trying to actually factorize the joint distribution and use uh, Bayes' uh, theorem or all these properties from probability, you, you wouldn't be able actually to go further. But uh, you, you can use this independence here. That's the point. And the, in the end, this distribution actually reflects the, the structure that you have, uh, actually reflects that uh, uh, the, 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 the Z and, and the Y are uh, always uh, pointing into X. So you, you have many, many graphs where uh, if you look at the Z variable, they are all with arrowheads. You don't know what's happening with X and Y, but every time that you have a, 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 a causal diagram representing this condition independence, you see that there are arrowheads pointing into Z. And the causal discovery, like the FCI algorithm, as I said, is going to learn these invariances. So the Z is going to be learned with arrowheads into it, and then the, there there are going to be circles in the point in the on on the, on, on, on the other ends because it could be anything else. It could be a tail, could be a tail with a bidirected edge, it could be just bidirected edge. You don't know, but that is an arrowhead pointing to Z. Uh, so there are many other examples here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give you more examples because you see here that uh, sometimes we can learn uh, even uh, through something that we call visibility. We call we, we detect some of these edges being uh, unconfounded. So they they are those that are good, that we could actually have identification of effects. I mean, they 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 could, right? Not necessarily, but those are. It, this is one of the requirements: is to have a visibility, which means that they are not confounded. They are x is ancestor of y and is even not confounded. Sometimes we also learn something that's a peers uh, peersly uh, is a spurious association, like z and y here. Um, that's another interesting case where z is an ancestor of y through like a visible edge. Uh, but that, that's another uh, directed edge, but it's not visible, which means that could be confounded. Um, and uh, so th this is just a pipeline of the algorithm. You see here that uh, you start with a model you, that induces these two the separations here, right? So uh, you observe in the data the probability, the, 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 the condition independences because of, of, of the faith, faithfulness assumption. So you are able to detect it through this uh, independences. You kind of refine a little bit your graph because you can remove the edge. So you form something that we call a skeleton. We apply some rules and these rules actually finish. I, I won't go over, uh, go over the rules, but you can check the rules in the paper by Gigi Zeng. But it, it, it's just simple rules. And then using those rules, you can uh, orient the arrowheads, the tails. You can see what's visible or not. And uh, this is a class, right? In, a, in this class, every, every Z is, an, is a known ancestor of X and Y. So that is this arrowhead here. So Z is always a known ancestor of X. Z is always a known ancestor of W. Also, Z is always an ancestor 
Uh, Z and W are ancestors of Y, right? So W is ancestor of Y, Z is ancestor of Y. And more than that, because of this visibility, Z is not confounded with Y. Uh, and uh, if you, you start trying to list all the models, there are many models that are following the same constraints here. So if, if you if you go over them, you see that, uh, uh, for example, that's an interesting one. You see that uh, that's a non-visible edge which means that, uh, so I just said that W is ancestor of Y, which is through this path, but it could be confounded. But the, the one from Z to Y is always not confounded. So it's actually, it's always a directed path like this. Um, uh, the first one here is a circle. So you can change, sometimes can be a directed edge, can be a bidirected edge, could be both. Also, there is a circle here. So you can have a, a tail, you can have a bidirected, you can have both. So you can actually have many modules that are all agreeing with this, but it's still a class. And uh, okay, all of them are part of the Markov equivalence class because they are all uh, through M separation inducing the same set of condition dependencies. Uh, we have much more about causal inference, uh, causal discovery. Uh, I want to give all these uh, links. Uh, for example, one interesting uh, direction of research is how to combine not only observational data, but with experimental data. That is even this paper here by Andrea, Mario, and Gonzalo. Also, those papers are by Biden Boeing, uh, but there are many, many others. Uh, I don't want to be extent, uh, uh, comprehensive here. Um, but uh, the point is we actually extended now instead of, uh, let me just skip here, uh, but we extended uh, instead of having a causal diagram as input, you can have a peg and the peg is completely data. You can learn it in a completely data-driven way, right? You just need data. Uh, and uh, that's the, the current stage of the, 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 the algorithm when you, you, you use the peg here as input. Um, oops, you, you have now the black box is the IDP algorithm, which is uh, IDP, CD, IDP because you can condition, you can infer conditional uh, in effects as well, but uh, you don't need to specify the graph if you don't have knowledge. Of course, this is a class, it's a larger class, it's no longer a class of just a structural causal model. You, ha you have more uh, graphs here, but you can try and see if the completely pipeline is going to give you a, a yes answer. And if that is, you are happy because you can just do in a completely data-driven way. Uh, of course, that's just showing that if you have effect identifiability, it doesn't matter what's the graph, you have like the same formula. And if you don't have it, then uh, it's because that exists as a graph. And uh, I'm going to end with this, uh, it's time already, but I'm going to end with this big picture of the field uh, and tell you that I covered a little bit of just the middle here, right? So how can you fill knowledge, construct a causal diagram, specifying some hypotheses or constraints, but basically we need this. Of course, we can also come directly from data here. So data can actually infer some distributions and from distributions, we can compute the causal diagram. Uh, this data could be more than just observational data. Combining with prior knowledge is a very, very hard challenge that we have right now. So if you're interested in research, I am really interested in the combination of combining prior knowledge and data. But there are many, many things happening here just to actually, from uh, distributions and knowledge, you can get the causal diagram. Then you have like a diff, this is just the engine. So the engine, I just explained about effect of identification, but we have many, many other tasks. Like we have generalizability, like instead of having the, imagine that you have the effect in one population, how can I transport this to another population? Um, or how can I, uh, fairness is another thing. How can I compute uh, path specific effects? So just effects that are coming uh, from some protective variables to the outcome. Um, uh, if I have a no answer, sometimes we have a partial identification. That's something very interesting happening in the field. So instead of having a point, uh, looking for point identifiability, maybe you have like an interval where the causal or the uh, interval for the causal effect. 
um, design of experiments. Sometimes you have a no answer, but maybe you can look for what are the best experiments that you can do to help both uh, constructing a better causal diagram or maybe getting the answer in the field that's called uh, design of experiments, causal experimental design. So there are many things in the field. I actually put a list here of uh, all these thoughts. Uh, but uh, estimation, estimation, we have a lot for the backdoor scenario, but extending to the other type of formulas, this is, uh, there are few techniques, but uh, that, that's is still not ideal. Uh, so that is too much, <laughs> I know, but uh, it's, a, it, it, it's a really rich field if you want to do research and it's really fundamental. So it, it we need many, many minds, uh, very creative and intelligent minds minds to actually solve all this problem. So we are uh, in the beginning, I would say, and uh, I would say that's also a very important component for the any other task that we're trying to do, especially if, we're when, if you want to reason about what's happening, especially if you want to um, the design, uh, like if you want to be a policy maker or if you want to have any explainability, to be honest. Uh, all right. Uh, that's my conclusions. I think I would just skip it. You probably are tired, but thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. Questions? We can also talk later if you are, maybe your questions are too long. <laughs> can you hear me? Thanks a lot for the talk. I guess we talk a little bit before this and uh... Um, I have this this kind of weird question. So if it's completely idiot, please sure. forgive me. It's never. So the talk is very interesting, and it seems like you work on like a very generalized framework to solve identification problem, right? So the question you try to answer is: if I know all this variable. I try to draw to draw the arrow. So I try to ask the question, X does X cause Y or Z cause Y or Z cause X and then X cause Y. But in an empirical setting, and especially when you mention policymaker, so I used to work with policymaker and I still do. Usually the question is very simple. Uh, do I why this happened? Right. So why Lehman Brothers collapsed? Uh, why unemployment goes up, right? So it seems like this framework is very useful when you have a lot of covariate and you have a lot of interaction. Right? And it's very powerful when you do all this do calculus. But in the empirical setting, usually what we do is the, is the opposite. We don't ask, I want to do identification in the sense that I want to know the exact graph where x1 cause x2, x2 dot 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 cause x100, and then x100 cause y. Right? I want to know why my observed interested outcome, y variable, change. And can I reduce it to a graph with x prime cause y? It can be wrong in the sense that when you do policy, all you care about is to modify the outcome, right? And you do it with whatever you have because you cannot affect the X100 like over there. You try to do it with whatever, whatever you have. So my, I have two questions. The first question is, it seems like in this framework, causality is like a binary thing, right? In, in a directed graph, you have an arrow point from X to Y, but there's no weight on this arrow. So should we, Think about weak causality, strong causality, or causality tend to zero in the sense that you do have in a graph an arrow, but do should I care about that arrow? One simple example is 
if I forget a cheese on my table at night, right? And the next day, it disappeared. So in this framework, I have to draw the whole graph. Like, who do I know? My parent, my friend, you, who stole my cheese, right? Or I can just say, what is the most potential, strongest causality link? Maybe there's a mouse in the house. So this is what we call in, I, I remember, if I remember correctly, this is what we call the argument of no miracle, no miracle argument in philosophy of science. Given a set of all potential causal graph that you have, given our technology of measurement, and I think measurement is important because what you call knowledge graph is depending on how you measure things. And as human, whatever measure measurement technology we have, it, it, it causes a bias in the fundamental knowledge, right? Because we don't measure the thing we cannot observe or we are insensitive to. So in that case, knowledge graph inherently is dynamic and biased. So should we search for a very precise and generalized causal map or we should just care about the thing in front of us and then the thing that we can actually improve? Thank you.
Hi again. So thank you. Um, so uh, yesterday, I think Andrew Lumpinen, and I'm not sure if I'm saying it properly, uh, but he talks about how language model can um, learn some causality through um, uh, so maximizing the uh, you know like the standard language model ob objective, like maximizing the likelihood of of data. So like if I take your uh, early example, like uh, maybe a language model can learn uh, to model a sentence like, uh, oh, a fire started, so we uh, send uh, some firefighters. And so it might understand that the cause of the fire was something, and then the firefighters were the answer to that. And so there's some causality. So. My question is, what do you think about this kind of work? And can it be set within the frameworks that you present? I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure. I was not here. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. But uh, um, we can discuss later if you give him more details. But uh, if, uh, if he's maximizing the parameters, so he has the model, right? Yeah, but it was like a standard language model, not, uh, not at all what you presented here like a uh, gpt or something like that yeah you need to understand uh the 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 model behind it if he 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 already assumes some structure of the model and it's just just missing or maybe it's enforcing sparsity or i don't know but in no nothing it, it, like if, if you have like just a model and you put all the possible parameters and relax all the if you have like if you don't assume causal sufficiency, which means that you could have also correlation among the arrow terms, this is not identifiable. It, that, that it's impossible to, to actually maximize it. I mean, you can you, you can have a plateau and then get, get just one of the plateau, but this, this is still not the true one. It could be this. <laughs> but if, if he imposed more constraints, it's possible that you have identifiability. So for example, I, in structure equation models, if you have like a, the confounders and Gaussian error terms, and I mean, you are going to assume a lot of things. So you have identifiability of the of the all the coefficients, and uh, as long as your assumptions are correct, this is this is a causal model, but you need to be correct about the assumptions. So I, I don't really know if uh, it it could be that he's just picking one. That's the maximum one, and if that's the case, and you have like many that are in the maximum, you are not sure that this is the true one. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, it was just a question about um, the algorithm that um creates the pags um and obviously uh it's a very new area for me so i didn't understand how it works so it might be that the answer to the question is it's already doing that but i was just wondering whether it's sort of like searching a very um like a huge search base of all the possible um graphs that you could draw and i was wondering whether um if you have a purely rl setting where your collected data is only ever collected through um uh into like uh intervening rather than having a data set which is uh, you know has got a load of variables which are potentially correlated maybe there's some um, causality but you don't know but if all of your data is always collected through interference with the environment um are you able to uh sort of like has anyone done any experiments as to whether or not you can build up um, good uh, causal graphs uh, in a more efficient manner by searching that very huge space of all the possible graphs, but using purely um, like interference data? It's turning off. Uh, so yes, uh, that's that's kind of related to what I said about combining experimental data and observational data. So it's just, uh, so, and, that, and also with experimental design, 
So it's just putting together both of them because basically you start just with observational data and then you have a, a peg, but then you can just now do some experimental design. But the problem is the, the works that I know, they are all assuming causal sufficiency for experimental design. So it wouldn't be for pegs, but can do for under the causal sufficiency assumption. But then you would know what's missing to actually recover more of the causal diagram. So in a reinforcement learning setting, you can actually be more efficient about what are the experimental experimentation that you're going to do. So because of this experimental design, so you you just learn. Uh, so you, you you learn what's the best uh, experiment, then you recover the graph, then you learn again what's the best experiment, and you learn again. Yeah, that 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 definitely works. Uh, but uh, I know one guy that was working experimental design under the latent uh, under the assumptions that uh, uh, without making the the causal sufficiency assumption, and he said that extending to the latent setting it's really crazy. It's hard to do, but he's trying. <laughs> Um, and the reinforcement learning approach, I, I, I think if some people are actually also, I, I know a guy that is working with causal reinforcement learning for causal structural learning. I mean, probably he's under the causal sufficiency assumption as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit hard. Just a quick comment on the previous question about my talk last night. It's a pity you missed it because I would have been interested in your thoughts on it, but maybe we can talk about it more often. Oh, nice, nice. Um, but the one of the points of the talk is that the data that language models are trained on actually consists of a mis mix of observations and interventions. Right? Oh, so okay. the kinds of data I that see, you get I on see. the internet is actually interventional data. Okay. So that's... even information about the causal structure of the world. That's that's sort of the basic point. Of the okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, that now makes sense. <laughs> Okay, so let's perhaps thanks, uh, Del. So enjoy lunch and in the afternoon, in the beginning of the afternoon, you'll be receiving a survey with some questions about the school. Okay, so try to answer this as well. By the end, in the closing session, we'll present some statistics from the survey, okay? Thank you.